you're listening to WPRI, your station for classical music in Princeton, New Jersey. Tonight's weather, intermittent thunder showers with possible clearing by morning. And now back to our music presentation. <coughs> tonight in order to set the record straight. So many peculiar articles are written about me. Now, sometimes I think the American press expects me to have only one occupation, genius, and to practice it 24 hours a day. But you see, they, they insist on writing about Uh, about my behavior. Please, you will excuse me. <laughs> Mozart. <laughs> They're playing Mozart, and I can't resist playing along with the orchestra. Welke Freude the music bereiten can. What joy music can bring. Such, such beauty and harmony. How could mankind live without it? This classical music <laughs> by the makers of Scarf. <laughs> and every dog, every age, just loves to eat. That Scarf in the bright purple can. <laughs> <laughs> For fine dining and relaxed co I love music, but not on the radio. All these advertisements. Even products for dogs and cats, as if they listen to the radio also. <laughs> But there is one program on the radio I always enjoy listening to. This man, Jack Benny, always makes me laugh. Perhaps I could imitate him. Mail. I cannot keep up with it all. <laughs> so here, here I am, relativity himself. That is what is written on this letter. There's no <coughs> name or address. It is just written to relativity himself, Princeton, New Jersey. And still they deliver it to me. Relativity himself. To discover a scientific truth is not to become that truth. I wonder if they called Isaac Newton gravity himself. <laughs> or Louis Pasteur rabies himself. <laughs> I'm always pleased when a man of science is honored, but the manner in which it is done is so peculiar. We scientists are a solitary breed, and our best work is done in isolation. In the temple of science are many mansions, and various are they who dwell within. Should write that down. I'm often called upon to give lectures, and I have such a difficult time thinking of intelligent things to say. <laughs> all over the world they ask me to speak, and all over the world they later regret it. <laughs> In the temple of science are uh, many mentions. Yeah, I will uh, 
I will use this sometime. But this letter, however, was addressed quite correctly. It arrived several days ago and has been troubling me ever since. It is from a little girl, nine years old. <clears throat> she writes to ask me, how could I be such a terrible monster? Is it true that I am the father of the atomic bomb? And do I really hate America? And her, her father enclosed this statement, which was read into the congressional record of the United States Congress in Washington by Representative Rankin, who is from the little girl's home state of Mississippi, a place I have never even seen, and printed in newspapers all across the state. Albert Einstein, this foreign-born agitator would have us plunge into another European war in order to further the spread of communism throughout the world. It is time the American people got wise to him. I want to receive no more letters like this one. So I'm I'm glad you could all join me here this evening, so perhaps I personally can help you to get wise to me. Tonight, my friends, I hope you will see no terrible monster and um, no foreign-born agitator, but only a man, a much too famous man whose reputation has grown so out of proportion uh, and if at times I do not live up to your expectations, please remember they are your expectations, not mine. <laughs> the relativity himself. <laughs> I must laugh. Uh, laughter is a wonderful gift. It uh, keeps us from taking ourselves too seriously. If I couldn't joke, perhaps I would go a little crazy. You see, when I, when I was a small boy in Munich, I never dreamed of such a life as this. I am sometimes asked, what signs of genius did you exhibit as a small child? And the answer is none. In fact, I had a great deal of difficulty even learning how to talk. I began to use words only at about the age of three, and if it wasn't really until nine or ten that I could speak, as well as other children my own age. But there is one incident I remember from early childhood. I must have been five or six and confined to bed because of some illness, chicken pox or measles, I don't remember. My father brought a small pocket compass into my bedroom for me to play with. I still have it. I've kept it for all these years. Well, I had, I had never seen one before, and I was astonished to discover that no matter which way I turned the compass, the needle always pointed in the same direction. I spent hours and hours experimenting with this amazing new toy. Uh, finally, I, I <laughs> came to realize there was something I couldn't see, <coughs> that no one, in fact, could see, that caused the needle always to point in the same direction. Invisible things cause things to happen. I wanted to get well immediately to find out more about these forces. I was fascinated by them. When I got well, I, I took the compass to school with me, but None of my classmates shared my fascination with him. But for the most part, I was a dreamy little boy, always lost in my own world. My teachers considered me to be a, a slow learner. There was even a time once when my father had to come to the school to speak with my headmaster about me. He, he led me to a, a corner of the classroom and had me stand there while 
he and the headmaster spoke together up by the blackboard. For the most part, they, they spoke quietly, but I did manage to overhear one part of the conversation. My father asked the headmaster, what profession do you think little Albert should adopt? And the, the headmaster answered him, Albert? Albert will niemals perfect sein. Albert will never make a success of anything. <laughs> <laughs> Too many teachers were uninspired and unaccomplished. They cared only for discipline and order. Learn to obey the rules and to memorize, but do not learn to think for yourself. <laughs> this was not true of my uncle Jacob, my father's younger brother, who was also a teacher. And I remember the first time he described algebra to me. Albert? Albert? Uh, 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 you're such a lucky little boy, Albert, for today. Today we begin our study of higher mathematics, algebra. Oh, algebra is such a merry little science. We go hunting for a mysterious little butterfly whose name we do not know, and so we call it X. Stalk <laughs> <laughs> our game. Now come, Albert, get you that game. our game. There, Albert, over by the bush, get it, and then we pounce at it and give it its rightful name. 367. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was the way to interest students in their studies. School was a constant source of problems for me. Not because of difficulties with my studies, but because of difficulties with my teachers. <laughs> Teaching is an honorable profession, and uh, I have known many fine teachers in my life, but I'm convinced that none were in Germany at the time I was in school. <laughs> <coughs> I had many problems in the gymnasium. But in America, you call high school. Uh, you see, at that time, I was beginning to believe that Although the universe presents us with many difficult riddles, it never presents us with unanswerable ones. God does not play dice with the universe. He is subtle, but not malicious. And so I began to question everything. My, my curiosity was so strong, I even began to question some of my teacher's statements. They didn't like this. And they said that I was a disruptive influence in the classroom and that, um, and that I was impeding the learning process. But you see, the world stood before me like a great eternal puzzle, and I wanted to spend the rest of my life trying to fit the pieces together. The more I questioned, the angrier my teachers got until our differences became irreconcilable. And so, part way through my high school studies, by mutual agreement, I left. How sad my papa looked to see me arriving home from boarding school, suitcase in hand. He, he had always wanted me to take up engineering, a sound, practical field, he said, where a man could carve out a nice, safe place for himself in society. But you see, my friends, I have never wanted any place in society. No, no, engineering was not for me, but how I hated to hurt my papa's feelings. And my whole family was quite upset for a while, but later on they accepted it and even arranged for me to continue my studies at a school in Switzerland, much more to my liking. And from there I was accepted into one of the finest technical colleges in all of Europe. Hmm. College. Well, if my high school teachers were upset with me and all my questions, this was nothing compared to what my college professors thought. My reception there was rather mixed. Some of my teachers liked me very much, but others found me arrogant. Well, I was young, concerned, inquisitive, dedicated. 
and arrogant. <laughs> In fact, one of my professors here, 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 became so upset with me that when I graduated, he wrote a very bad recommendation. And because I had a troublemaker's reputation as a result of it, I received no immediate teaching offers. So I was out of school and out of work. And my skepticism for all kinds of authority was now complete. But that was good because skepticism is the foundation of a sound scientific attitude. <coughs> you see, I deal with a, a conception of reality rather than with observable reality itself. My work involves the imagination and is expressed through equations. In <coughs> physics, <coughs> the highest standard of precision in the description of spatial relations such as only the use of mathematical language can give. Yet, yet these abstract symbols must correspond to a pre-existing physical reality if they are to have validity. They are the foundation on which our temple of science is built. <laughs> physical reality and the abstract. This is how I make my living. Not engineering. Once, my second wife, Elsa, tried to fix liver, one of my favorite foods, in a new way. When I arrived home from the institute, I found it in a pot of boiling water at the stove. But I had to tell her, Elsa, you are always so good to me, and this is a nice surprise, but I must tell you, the boiling point of liver is very high, much higher than the water can reach. You must fix it in a different way, or it will be ruined. This was one of the few occasions on which my scientific knowledge proved practical. <laughs> my best work is done here, not with measuring instruments at a desk. My mind is my office, and I take it with me wherever I go. At dinner parties, lectures, concerts, I often part company with those around me and adjourn to my office. Concerts. <laughs> I remember a concert I attended once with a friend, Marcel Grossman, and how I embarrassed him. Uh, the orchestra that night was playing Stravinsky, but all through the concert, without being aware of it, I kept humming something by Mozart. <laughs> but you see, I was working on an extremely difficult mathematical equation, and Mozart is so much better for my thinking. Had I known that within a few years the Nazis would ban all of Stravinsky's compositions, I assure you, I would have paid much closer attention. Hitler. His mad vision was revealed by the early 1930s. It was then the world should have opposed him. My scientific theories accepted the world over were attacked in Germany as subversive Jewish propaganda the bankruptcy of the relativity theory. Einstein, his deceitful conclusions and frauds. This was what they wrote about me, and not just about me, but by 1932, all Jews were under attack. Yet it is sometimes said that I treat the Germans too harshly. Now that the war is over, we should be more forgiving. It is impossible unthinkable to forgive genocide. I had hoped that the end of the war would bring peace and justice. Instead, it has brought tragedy. With the atomic bomb, the most savage revolutionary force was born since prehistoric man discovered fire. My name is sometimes linked with this terrible weapon. Some of my early discoveries contributed to the splitting of the atom. How could I at that time have anticipated the perversion of my theories by others? A knife in the hands of a surgeon can be a life-giving instrument, or it can be used to kill. Who can control this? My son, Edward. 
when he was small. <clears throat> you know what I was just thinking? <laughs> How good an ice cream cone would taste right now. <laughs> so that used to be one of our great delights to go out for ice cream together. Oh, I would also go with my other son, Hans, for ice cream, but Edward and I, we shared such a passion for it. Edward, Edward, come, it's time to go. Ah, oh, you were wearing a new shirt I gave you. It looks very good. Uh, listen, Edward, why don't we go for pastry today instead of ice cream, just for a change, hmm? No, 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 don't cry. Papa was only joking with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a bad joke. Of course, of course we will go for ice cream. Just like always. Come. So, Edward, what flavor do you think you're going to choose today? Strawberry. Ooh. What delicious times we had together. But, um, Edward. Edward outgrew ice cream. Uh, well, I, it appears, did not. <laughs> My family. Perhaps if I had had more time for them, things would have been different. It is a, it is a part of my life that I regret very much. I, I'm driven, constantly driven to work. Even when I was courting my first wife, Maleva, much of our time together was spent talking about science. We met in college where she was also a physics student. I discussed many of my early theories with her when nobody else would listen. <laughs> my love letters sometimes included very romantic subjects such as parallelism, <laughs> kinetic energy of molecules, or Boltzmann's theory of gases. <laughs> Milena and I shared many thoughts, but um, later when she had to share the life of the most famous scientist in the world, when her name became only Albert Einstein's wife or the little Frau, <coughs> This made things very difficult. We began to fight over nothing and grew further apart day by day. And I, I saw nothing of this, nothing. Uh, there, there is a saying by Schopenhauer, a man can surely do what he wills to do, but he cannot determine what he wills. <laughs> I believe this to be true. Oh, uh, uh, so, since I knew you would be here this evening, I, I wrote down a rather simple example illustrating the theory of relativity. And I have it, I have it right here. <laughs> there it is. In the temple of science. <laughs> no, I, I have it, I have it. Yeah, somewhere. <laughs> well. Imagine you were standing in the middle of a soccer field during an electrical storm. And suppose that lightning struck both goals at either end of the field at approximately the same time. To you, the flashes would appear to be simultaneous. But suppose that alongside this field ran a railroad track and the man was, a train was passing by in that very moment. A man looking out the window also saw the flashes, but he was in a moving vehicle and nearer to one goal. To him, the flashes would not appear to be at the same time. 
he would see one before the other. We are on a planet that is constantly spinning on its axis. At the same time, it is turning about the sun. And also, at the same time, the entire solar system is moving. Therefore, any measurements of phenomena must be relative to this motion. And so measurements will vary according to the ordinates and coordinates selected. The classical Newtonian theory has been refuted. According to Newton, the number of lines of force which come from infinity and terminate in a mass m are proportional to the mass m. If, on the average, the mass density P0 is constant throughout the universe, then a sphere of volume V will enclose the average mass P0V for unit area of the surface of the sphere. The number of lines of force which enter the sphere are thus proportionate to P0V over F or P0R. Hence, the intensity of the field at the surface would ultimately become infinite with increasing radius of the sphere, which, of course, is impossible. <laughs> you got that? <laughs> I see, I'm getting the usual puzzled looks. Find a place for this in your offices, and we will perhaps return to it later. The most important thing to me is not achieving correct solutions to problems, but the effort made to solve these problems. The search for truth is always more important than the possession of it. I've always enjoyed the story of the little dog who found the tip of a bone sticking up out of the ground. He dug furiously into the earth and found another bone and then another and another and another until he had unearthed the entire skeleton of a dinosaur. And then he died. <laughs> <laughs> but in total ecstasy. <laughs> We must all strive to work to our full potential and beyond it if possible. To make a goal of happiness in one's life has never appealed to me. <clears throat> a good pipe can be so satisfying. <laughs> But now my doctor has warned me about smoking too much. He even made me promise to buy no more tobacco. I gave him my word. So now I've made arrangements with friends to steal it from them instead. <laughs> Do you think you understand relativity now? It has been said that only six men in the entire world truly understand it. And I am not one of them. <laughs> I understand it. Much of my early scientific theorizing was done while I was a clerk in the Swiss patent office in Bern. It was tedious work, not terribly exciting, but as I could get no university teaching position, it served its purpose. I began there in 1902 and stayed until 1909 six years as a clerk in the seven years mm. mathematics is not my best subject <laughs> i sat at a desk and checked out the technical details of patent applications submitted of course i also did my own work there when things got slow Oh, I can still see Herr Haller, my superior, wagging his finger at me. Einstein, what are these scientific papers doing at the patent office? This is not a laboratory. You are here to work on patent applications submitted. Do you understand? Albert, oh, oh, but listen, your work is good, but you lack discipline. You daydream too much. You must learn to concentrate. Right, now, put away these papers and get back to work. The scientific papers he had me put away laid the entire foundation for the theory of relativity. It was through publication of my works while a patent clerk in Switzerland that I created my international reputation. I lived in a small flat in Bern with my wife and two sons. All of my spare time, you could find me there rocking a cradle or 
burping a baby with one hand and writing scientific papers with the other. I had little time for anything else. Finally, I was given the opportunity to teach at um, several universities over the next few years, and then, then I was appointed to head the physics department of the newly created Kaiser Wilhelm Institute in Berlin. A great honor for a simple, absent-minded Jew. So it was that the beginning of World War I found me back in Germany with mixed emotions. Being a, a devout pacifist at the time, I would rather have been shot than participate in a war. My feelings were not shared by the average European. There was a mad rush to enlist and join the fighting. The man who enjoys marching along to the strains of a military band received his brain by mistake. The spinal cord alone would be sufficient. I wrote a letter. Some called it a manifesto at the, at the University of Berlin. I wanted to gather support from my fellow professors in opposition to the war. Do you know it received only six signatures? Only six men out of thousands had the daring to risk their reputation for peace. When World War I finally ended, <coughs> a third of Europe's young men had been killed. I love electrical storms, the forces of nature coming together. An example of relativity. Um, suppose a man was standing in the middle of a soccer field during an electrical storm. <laughs> I've told you that one already, haven't I? Excuse me. Another example of relativity. A teacup filled with tea. The leaves rest in the bottom of the cup. If you take a spoon and begin to stir the tea, the leaves will start to rise. The faster you stir, the higher the leaves will rise in the liquid. Position of the leaves in the cup is relative to the motion imparted to the liquid. Yeah, that was a good one. <laughs> so in 1918, the war finally ended. By then, the Adelin de Physic, a scientific journal of great importance, had published several of my articles, including the foundation of the general theory of relativity. Scientifically, I was working at fever pitch. The years spent searching in the dark for a truth which you can feel but cannot express. The intense passion alternating between confidence and despair. The constant struggle for a proof when every proof led to an even greater puzzle. What times those were. Uh, by now, I was known to scientists all over Europe at dinner parties, meetings, Scientific conclaves, I was asked questions by men whose reputations were enormous. Whatever caused you to believe that light rays do not travel in a straight line, Herr Einstein, but are affected by the force of gravity? My dear sir, I simply imagined that this was so and set out to prove it. My dear Herr Einstein, is it not true that most of your theories are based on mere speculation? For instance, whatever led you to believe that photons exist in light rays? My dear sir, whatever led you to believe that they do not? <laughs> One should never theorize about something because it is easy to prove, but because of a feeling, an intuition that it should be proved. It must be proved. My colleagues were amazed by my science, but angered by my politics. I was called a genius and an idiot. And I delighted in telling people that I was both simultaneously, and that this was yet another proof of the theory of relativity. 
London Times became the first newspaper to embrace my theory and make it known to the masses. They printed an in-depth article on relativity and what it meant, in which they said that my discoveries would require a new philosophy of the universe and would sweep away much of what had previously been believed. For the most part, my theories were slowly accepted, but there were those who said that I was a, an agent of the devil sent to destroy all that was sacred in the world. And I, I began to receive hate mail, absurd cartoons which put me into a boxing ring with Sir Isaac Newton began to appear, and me wearing boxing gloves and shorts, as, as if Newton and I were contemporaries engaged in some athletic struggle. But Newton was a very great man, and I am flattered to be compared to him, but why in such a ridiculous manner? And by now, the, the press, the scientific community, the academic community, political organizations, civic organizations, charitable organizations, women's organizations, and others all felt they had the right to demand a portion of my time. I began to long for the quiet days at the patent office where I could just be myself, do my work, and not worry about the consequences. seen a man take off his vest without first removing his jacket. <laughs> that is a trick I began to perform at parties. Oh, so many formal events I now had to attend. I had, I had only one outfit for all such occasions, and believe me, the moths in my closet enjoyed it more than I did. Occasionally, I would take my violin and play. Only when asked, of course. <laughs> I would much rather perform tricks or play music than try to discuss relativity over alcohol and peanuts. Uh, and the more stuffy and formal the occasion, the more I enjoyed being silly. <laughs> and why do they insist on treating me like a sideshow in a circus? Always on display, as if I exist only for the amusement of others. Uh, to be a scientist today is no easy thing. And the worst part is we see our discoveries perverted, <coughs> used for purposes we never intended. The bomb, the terrible atomic bomb. Mankind now has the potential to destroy himself. Bravo for mankind. <laughs> I should have been a musician. Well, music is a great joy to me. There is something so captivating precise about it. It soothes the spirit when all else fails, especially the classics, Bach, Brahms, Mozart. <coughs> Mozart. Now there was a true genius. Uh, a musician has much in common with a scientist. We both seek to express the unknown. The most beautiful thing we can experience is the mysterious. It is the source of all true art and science. How oh, I love to ponder the universe. I always had a solitary nature, even in childhood, and, and so I have never completely belonged to any country or circle of friends or, um, or even, even to my family. This contributed greatly to the breakup of my marriage to my first wife, Mileva. As the demands of the world took up more and more of my time, I compensated by giving less of that time to my family. And Mileva and I were together more in public than in private, and in private I was usually lost in my office. And the more famous I became, the more the troubles with us got worse. Well, it, is, it is ironic, but the money I received from winning the Nobel Prize in 1921 helped me to pay for my divorce. My divorce. Such a toll it took. My my poor little Edward, his, his physical health deteriorated after our separation and, um, and then a breakdown. 
which was very painful to me. He, he was treated for a mental disorder, from which he never fully recovered. Spaceships rush toward each other at great speed. And there's nothing else in the cosmos, no landmarks anywhere. How can the men in one spaceship tell if the other is moving or not? And if they are both traveling at faster than the speed of light, will they even see each other? <laughs> My theory even inspired a limerick. <clears throat> <laughs> there was a young lady named Bright who traveled much faster than light. She went out one day in a relative way and came back <laughs> the previous night. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am past 60 now and I travel considerably slower than light. Uh, I was asked recently by an impudent young reporter if I still had any interest in sex. I told her, Freud once said, sex after 60 is like vintage wine, a little more rare, but mellower and longer lasting. <laughs> Do you know what she wrote? That Sigmund Freud and I drank wine together and participated in long-lasting orgies. <laughs> uh, I noticed some of you staring at my clothing. I'm sometimes asked if I dress this way to get attention. I've always dressed this way. It was only after I became famous that anyone noticed. <laughs> the time is much too valuable to waste on trivialities such as clothing. Uh, that's why I, I gave up wearing socks and suspenders. Haircuts are another waste of time. The, the, the look of my coat and trousers has no bearing on the validity of my theories. Well, the best trick. <laughs> Malay and I, our only problems occur when we are traveling together. In our home, she's constantly rearranging the furniture, moving this here and that there. But on a, on a journey with her, I become her only piece of furniture. And so she constantly fusses with me until I become a bit frayed at the edges. Just a bit. This trick could be <coughs> described as the study of inside out and outside in. Oh, I wish all my work were this easy. And I have so little time, so much to do. <laughs> Um, unified field theory, but, um, but I'm a bit tired, and um, I think we could all do with some rest, uh, to, or, or, or perhaps to adjourn to our offices or um, maybe a bathroom. <laughs> when we come back, I will tell you how I came to America, this wonderful country. <laughs> mind that I have put on my old sweater. It is just so comfortable. And now that we have got to know each other better, it will be all right, yeah?
My doctor has told me an apple a day will keep him away <laughs> if, if I don't cut my finger. Soon I will be able to add to these equations that concern my unified field theory. I've spent many years searching for one source of causality for all that happens in the universe. I've thought perhaps 100 times as much about this as I did relativity. Most of my fellow scientists consider it to be a hopeless quest. There is a story circulating in scientific circles that Aristotle, Jesus, Sigmund Freud, and myself all died and went to heaven. No, I'm telling you wrong. Jesus was already there. <laughs> great controversy was raging about the meaning of life. The, the heavenly tribunal was called, and we were all brought before it. And Aristotle said the meaning of life could be found here. Jesus said it could be found here. Freud said it could be found here. And I said it was all relative. <laughs> of life and the quality of life. These are great concerns and science has much to say about them. But today the research has become so costly that only the wealthiest nations can afford to participate. And so now in 1946 two powerful countries appear ready and eager to dominate the future. Russia and our own United States. However, when science is controlled by government and political ideology rules the laboratory, the fate of mankind hangs by a tiny thread. How I pray that science does not lead to a mutual destruction of our <coughs> And the dead, the dead, can the same science that destroyed them also bring them back to life? I'm sorry, I, I did not invite you here tonight to preach to you about the future of science. I, I simply thought that um, this would be a good time for, um, as Representative Rankin said, people to get wise to me. And you see, if we are to spend an evening together in which I have the great luxury of being the only one who talks, you do run the risk, I will talk too much. <laughs> but I, I am not, and cannot be, just an uncaring look man whose only concern is his precious reputation. No, I am afraid that what is important to a man like me is not what others think of him, but the quality of his thought and the dedication with which he pursues it. Many great men have influenced my thinking. Gandhi, Buber, Minkowski, Poincaré, Born. I will continue in their tradition. Theory exists to be proven or disproven, never to be abandoned. Uh, yes, of course, it is true. Some of my thinking confuses people. I admit that. Hmm. I even wrote a limerick about it. I, I composed it while posing for a statue by a sculptor friend of mine, Jacob Epstein, in the early 1930s. I had to remain absolutely motionless. It was very unpleasant. And this is the result. Three wonderful people named Stein. There's Gertrude and Epp and Ein. Gertrude writes in blank verse. Epp's statues are worse, and nobody understands Ein. <laughs> Every month now, I receive dozens of letters from Jewish refugees asking me to help them or a member of their family find a place in the academic community. Occasionally, I get carried away in my desire to help. Well, once, I wrote four separate re letters of recommendation on behalf of four different applicants for the same teaching position at Harvard University. But um, I suppose it is better to help too much than not to help at all. There's a rumor that I may be offered the presidency of the soon-to-be-created State of Israel. Uh, this is a 
A very great honor, but it is a position for which I am totally unsuited. I am a scientist who works with theories and equations, not a politician who deals with people and opinions. I am deeply committed to assisting the cause of Israel in every way possible, and one of those ways is to never become its president. <laughs> Perhaps you are wondering how a scientist such as myself becomes so involved in world politics. I wonder that myself sometimes. But you see, as I have traveled about the world, I have found it impossible to shut my eyes to injustice. It is everywhere. And so I speak out. I, I do not like to anger people, but at times I must. I remember when I first experienced my Jewishness and the the problems that later on this caused me. Uh, it was in Berlin as a young man that I first saw Jewish prosecution. So many doors closed, so much potential wasted, yet Jews would not band together for the common good. I, I became committed to Zionism mainly for the unifying and educational effect this could have on Jews all over the world. I spoke it fundraising events and led my name to the cause. When the Nazis came to power, I paid for these actions. It was in 1933 that I became a refugee and left Germany forever. I took with me only my violin, some old clothes and this suitcase filled with papers, papers from the early days at the patent office. Calculations on quantum mechanics, scientific articles of great importance, and um, other papers of no value whatsoever except to me. The Nazis then took over my house, claiming it was being used as a storage center for arms and ammunition, and that I and other Jews were plotting to overthrow the government. They confiscated my bank account and all of my personal property. They branded me a traitor and put a $5,000 price on my head. I, I never knew my head could be so valuable. <laughs> I, I still keep many papers in this suitcase. I'm what in America you call a, um, a chipmunk. No, 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 not a chipmunk, um, like a kind of rodent, um, a pack rat. <laughs> so it was that in 1933, Elsa, my second wife, and I came to Princeton, where I have made my home ever since. I joined the faculty as a member of the Institute for Advanced Studies, a position I was happy to accept. We were provided with this charming house, which Elsa immediately began to redecorate. And Elsa also handled my salary negotiations as my original request was so low, the dean of the university complimented me on my sense of humor. <laughs> Establishing a regular routine was difficult due to my unfortunate notoriety. I became a kind of community landmark, like an ancient cathedral or a bird sanctuary. <laughs> Even when I was just out in the garden picking flowers for Elsa people, they had to stop and stare at me. Am I relativity himself? No, no, I am Professor Dr. Albert Einstein. It is a pleasure to meet you, too. Hello there. Where did you get all those red curls? You wish to take a photograph of me? Well, all right. <laughs> no, 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 Elsa is not available to be photographed this morning. Goodbye. Uh, oh, right there, right there, yeah. This is for you. Goodbye. The celebrity game is usually a harmless nuisance, but um, it can be dangerous. Stories are created about me just to sell newspapers. Stories which are, are not true. I've never even met any of these Hollywood motion picture stars that they say I am friends with. And I am, I am not a godless communist looking for ways to overthrow the capitalist system. I do believe we need 
some form of world government to regulate the conduct of all nations, but I'm not advocating violent revolution. This could be used only to avoid another world war which could end all human existence. Surely we, we should be prepared to make the same sacrifices for the cause of peace that others ungrudgingly make for the cause of war. The freedom of the press is essential in a democracy, but there should be some responsibility to tell the truth about the man, his work, and what he believes in. Life in this country. There is so much to get used to. Your money, for instance. Why is a 10 cent piece smaller than a 5 cent piece? If you know the troubles this causes me in crowded buses and in stores, I sometimes get very angry and say the most terrible things, but in German, so people can't understand that. <laughs> and the young people here, so full of curiosity and energy. I don't come directly into contact with the students here, but I'm, I, I do see many of them. Princeton, you see, has a great many ice cream parlors. <laughs> I've even found one with 28 different flavors. <laughs> yes, good afternoon. Uh, today, I think that I would like to have the um, strawberry. <laughs> Thank you. Young lady, uh, is this seat taken? Yeah, I'm Dr. Einstein, that is right. Oh, it is good to meet you, too. Yeah, I'm on the faculty here at the Institute for Advanced Studies. You wish I could help you with your homework? <laughs> well, it would be a pleasure, but then first I must tell you that I am what in America you call a high school dropout. <laughs> Young lady, when you come in next time, try the strawberry. It is delicious, I think. Well, it didn't take long for me to establish a reputation on campus as an unusual character. <laughs> Hello, Princeton University. Uh, can I have Dean Eisenhardt in the graduate school? Huh? Oh, he would be in class for the next <coughs> three hours. Uh, uh, well, but perhaps you could help me. Uh, can, um, can I have uh, Dr. Einstein's address, please? Hmm? Uh, yeah, yeah, I know this is confidential, but you see, my problem is, this is Dr. Einstein. You see, I was walking across the campus, and I'm afraid I've forgotten where I live. <laughs> One, twelve verses, Street. thank you. <laughs> Uh, these problems were not serious, but um, there were other problems in, in physics. I was then, and am still now, taking a position directly opposite to my colleagues. They, they had been moving further and further away from causality toward the belief that the universe was accidental, governed only by the laws of chance. It, it was claimed, for instance, that in experiments with radiation, an electron of its own accord chooses, actually chooses, when and where to jump from its orbit. They say there is no way you can predict this. Nine, there is a reason why it is so that we have not yet discovered. The human mind is capable of analyzing all physical phenomena, but it is an ongoing and extremely complicated puzzle. If I try 99 different solutions to a problem and none of them work, I have moved forward, for I have gained 99 pieces of information I did not previously have. My unified field theory, I will not abandon it. Occasionally, I go back now, as older men do, and read again the articles that I wrote in my youth. Strange and remote these papers now seem. Is it perhaps that I have grown so old that I see everything in a dimmer light? Or did the, did the romance of youth cloud my vision with too much optimism? It seems to me that much of the sanctity and order of life has vanished, and that standards of decency, virtue, and truth have diminished. But to grow old is to grow cynical. 
the three worst things about growing old. The loss of memory, the loss of memory, and the third one I've forgotten. <laughs> Last week, I was walking across the campus when a group of students stopped me to ask if the quantum mechanical description of physical reality could now be considered complete. When we finished our discussion, I, um, I had to ask them in which direction I was walking before they stopped me. They pointed toward the institute. Good, I said. That means I have already had my lunch. <laughs> That is not true. <laughs> it is just one of the silly stories they tell about me. I find it amusing. In Europe, when I was a young man, I was not so forgetful. But age changes many things. As we grow older, our beliefs change in relation to the circumstances of our lives. And we sometimes come into conflict with our earlier ideals. Perhaps that is why I have trouble sleeping lately. I awake in the middle of the night, caught in the most terrifying dream. It begins pleasantly enough. I am, I am at home alone, listening to my music. Ladies and gentlemen, we interrupt this broadcast for a special bulletin. The father of the atomic bomb, Albert Einstein, is dead. Nine. Nine. A devout pacifist in his younger days, later in his life, Dr. Einstein encouraged the world to arm itself, stating publicly that every sword raised against Germany was a sword raised for peace. The Nazis had to be stopped at all costs. Once the leading scientist in the world decided that <coughs> civilization could only be saved through armed might, fire bombs, and rockets, it was a Nine. short step to the development of the atomic bomb. Nine. Nine. Because of Albert Einstein, science has taken us to the brink of the Armageddon. Bomb, the bomb, the, the bomb! When I am awake, unable to sleep anymore. Yes, it is true. I spoke out against the Nazis. They were slaughtering my brethren. They were butchers who wanted to subjugate the entire world. There was a letter. A letter. Up. An stricken letter I wrote out of desperation to President Roosevelt in 1939. I advised him the Nazis were stockpiling uranium in an attempt to develop atomic explosives. I suggested that perhaps we should do this as well. Had I known the Nazis would be stopped before they could develop such weapons, I never would have written that letter. Afterward, I did everything in my power to correct it, but it was too late. Hiroshima, Nagasaki. <coughs> How can scientific progress be used for such destruction? The purpose of science is to serve mankind, not destroy it. What role did I play in this tragedy? In my solitary quest to explore the unknown, have I flown too close to the sun and brought back everlasting fire? And now there are plans to build even bigger bombs capable of destroying all life on Earth. No, we must not let them do this. It is the responsibility of every one of us to let the leaders of our great nations know we are against these weapons. Tell them. We must tell them. Moral progress is 
always more important than scientific achievement. Yet now morality itself is called relative, and this too they blame on me. Yet men can create as well as destroy. Surely there are many more of us who wish to experience beauty rather than war. As long as men can believe in music, I will believe in the future of mankind. You know, I sometimes give recitals for actual audiences who pay. <coughs> Not like Yasha Heifetz. More like Albert Einstein. There was even a music critic on a small newspaper who wrote about me once that I was the foremost violinist in the world. And so I, I cut out the article and I sent it to Yasha. And I wrote, Yasha, if you will promise to stay out of physics, I will promise to stay out of music. <laughs> and so, she loved to listen to me practice. She would sit right here, right here, and um, every time I made a mistake, she would laugh and clap her hands and call me Mr. Benny. <laughs> These days now, after her recent death, I feel more and more alone. Things are, are very changed for me here at 112 Mercer Street without her. How I wish things could have been different. You see, I spent so little time with her during her final illness in hospital. But as usual, I was caught up in my work. My terrible passion to know more. But yet I will, I will remain here, here in the home she put so much of herself into. Her presence, it hangs in the air like a fine, soft mist. Without her, without my Elsa, I am like a rubberless ship. But, um, But uh, she too lost her bearings from time to time. <laughs> Once, uh, at, a, at a formal dinner party given in my honor, uh, it was one of those um, stuffy uh, occasions where all the seating arrangements are marked with little cards. While all the scientists had a lettuce and tomato salad on the plate in front of us, in Elsa's <coughs> honor, on the plate in front of her was placed a beautiful orchid. So while, while we scientists spoke and solved the mysteries of the world, Elsa quietly took up her knife and fork and ate the entire morning. <laughs> Later, she said that it was delicious. That was my answer. So I am alone now, a renegade in my vision of the universe. Once I was called the great destroyer of tradition, now it seems I'm the only one left who fights to uphold it. I've always loved the, the beauty and the precision of mathematics, but uh, this equation that will not work. Not this way. I must try a different approach. Such is the life of a scientist. God does not tell us in advance whether the course we are to follow is the correct one. 
And so I do not fear being wrong, and I often am. Yet I, I still don't believe in an accidental universe, void of causality. And neither do I believe in a God who rewards and punishes the objects of his creation, who, whose purposes are modeled after our own, who is, in short, in a reflection of human frailty. You know, it is enough for me to try and humbly comprehend the smallest part of the intelligence that is manifest in nature. To gaze in rapturous wonder and amazement at the harmony of natural law. And to remember that morality is the greatest endowment of mankind. And of course, music. Sometimes I feel like the little dog who discovered the dinosaur, remember? Not only instead of digging up just one skeleton, oh, I have dug up so many. And each one hanging onto the tail of the next like elephants in a circus. So while there is still time left me, I will continue with my work and ponder the sacred mysteries of the universe. The unknown. How beautiful that is to contemplate. 